All right. Today, today we're going to talk about Spark. Um, Spark's a essentially a successor to uh, MapReduce. You can think of it as a kind of um, evolutionary step in MapReduce. Um, and one reason we're looking at it is that it's widely used today for data center computations. Um, it's, it's turned out to be very popular and very useful. Um, one interesting thing it does, which uh, we'll pay attention to, is that it, it generalizes the kind of two stages of MapReduce, the map and the reduce, into um, a complete notion of multi-step data flow graphs that, um, and um, this is both helpful for flexibility for the programmer, it's more expressive, and it also gives the system, the Spark system, a lot more to chew on um, when it comes to optimization and uh, dealing with faults, dealing with failures. Um, and also for the, from the programmer's point of view, it supports iterative applications, applications that, you know, loop over the data effectively um, much better than MapReduce does. You can cobble together a lot of stuff with multiple MapReduce applications running one after another, um, but it's all a lot more convenient in, uh, uh, in Spark. Okay, so uh, I think I'm just gonna start right off with the example application. Um, this is the code for uh, PageRank, um, and I've just copied this code with a few, um, a few changes from some sample source code in the, um, in the Spark source. Um, I guess it's actually a little bit hard to read. Let me just give me a second while I try to make it bigger. Um. All right. Okay. So if this is if this is too hard to read, is um, there's a copy of it in the notes, um, and it's an expansion of the code in section three two two in the paper. Um, it's PageRank, which is a algorithm that Google uses, a pretty famous algorithm for calculating how important different uh, web search results are. Um, what PageRank is trying to do, um, well, actually, PageRank is sort of widely used as an example of something that um, doesn't actually work that well in MapReduce. And the reason is that uh, PageRank involves a bunch of sort of distinct steps and worse, PageRank involves iteration. There's a loop in it that's gotta be run many times. Um, and MapReduce just has nothing to say about, um, about iteration. Um, the uh, input to PageRank uh, for, for this version of PageRank is, is just a giant collection of um, lines, one per link in the web. And each line then has two URLs, the URL of the page containing a link and the URL of, of the link that that page points to. Um, and you know, the intent is that you get this file from by crawling the web and looking at all the, um, all collecting together all the links in the web. So the input is absolutely enormous. Um, and um, as just a sort of a silly little example for us, to, for uh, when I actually run this code, um, I've given some example input here. Um, and this is the way the input would really work. It, it's just lines, each line with two URLs. And I'm using U1 as the URL of a page and U3, for example, as the uh, URL of a link that that page points to, just for convenience. Um, and so the, the web graph that, that this input file represents has only three pages in it, um, one, two, three. I can just interpret the links. There's a link from one to three. There's a link from one back to itself. Uh, there's a web link from two to three. There's a web link from two back to itself. And there's a web link from three to one. So it's like a very simple uh, graph structure. Uh, what PageRank is trying to do, it's uh, you know estimating the importance of each page. What that really means is that, um, and it's estimating the importance based on uh, whether other important pages have links to a given page. Um, and what's really going on here is it's kind of modeling the estimated probability that a user who clicks on links will 
end up on each given page. Um, and so it has this user model in which the user has a 85% chance of following a link from the user's current page, um, following a randomly selected link from the user's current page to wherever that link leads, and a 15% chance of simply switching to some other page, even though there's not a link to it, as you would if you, you know, entered a URL directly into the um, browser. Um, and um, the idea is that the PageRank algorithm kind of runs this um, repeatedly. It sort of simulates a user looking at a page and then following a link um, and kind of adds the from pages importance to the target pages importance and then sort of runs this again. And it's going to end up um, in, in the system like uh, map uh, page rank on spark it's going to kind of run this simulation for all pages in parallel um, iter iteratively uh, the um, and, and the idea is that it's going to keep track the algorithm is going to keep track of the page rank of every single page of every single URL um, and update it as it sort of simulates random user clicks um, and that eventually that those ranks will converge on kind of the true uh, final values. Now, because it's iterative, um, although you can code this up in Rap MapReduce, it's a pain. It can't be just a single MapReduce program. It has to be multiple, um, uh, you know, multiple calls to a MapReduce application where each call uh, sort of simulates one step in the iteration. So you can do it in MapReduce, but it's a pain and it's also kind of slow because MapReduce, it's only thinking about one map and one reduce and it's always reading its input from the GFS, from disk and the GFS file system and always writing its output, which would be the sort of updated per page ranks. Um, every stage also writes the sort of updated uh, per page ranks to the files in GFS also. So there's a lot of fi file I.O. if you run this as sort of a sequence of MapReduce applications. Um, all right, so uh, we have here this um, uh, version of PageRank code that came with, um, came with Spark. And I'm actually gonna run it for you. Um, I'm gonna run the whole thing for you, this code shown here on the input that I've shown, just to see what the final output is. And then I'll look through, uh, and we'll go step by step. And uh, um, show how it executes. All right, so here's the, um, you should see a, a screen share now of a terminal window. Um, and I'm showing you the input file uh, that I'm gonna hand to this uh, page rank program and now um, here's how I run it. I've you know I've uh, downloaded a copy of Spark to my laptop. It turns out to be pretty easy, um, and a bit sort of pre-compiled version of it. I can just run. Um, it just runs in the Java virtual machine. I can run it very easily. So it's actually doing downloading Spark and running simple stuff. It turns out to be pretty straightforward. So I'm going to run the the uh, code that I show with the input that I show. Um, and we're going to see a lot of sort of junk error messages go by. Um, but in the end, uh, Spark runs the program uh, and prints the final result. And we get these three ranks for the three pages I have. And um, apparently, page one has the highest rank. Um, uh, and I'm not completely sure why, but that's what the uh, the algorithm ends up doing. So, you know, of course, we're not really that interested in the algorithm itself um, so much as how it ex how Spark um, executes it. All right. Um, so I'm going to hand to understand what the programming model is in Spark um, because it's uh, perhaps not quite what it looks like. I'm going to hand um, the program line by line to the uh, Spark interpreter. So you can just fire up um, this Spark shell thing and uh, type code to it directly. Um, so I've sort of prepared a version of the MapReduce program that um, I can run a line at a time here. So the first line is this um, 
line in which it reads the, we're asking Spark to read this input file. Um, and it's, you know, it's the input file I showed with the uh, three pages in it. Um, okay, so one thing to notice here is, is that uh, when Spark reads a file, what it's actually doing is reading a, a file from a, a GFS-like distributed file system. It ha happens to be um, HDFS, the Hadoop file system. But this HDFS file system is very much like GFS. And so if you have a huge file, as you would with, if you had a file with all the URLs, all the links and the web on it, um, HDFS is going to split that file up among lots and lots, but, you know, by by chunks, it's going to shard the file over lots and lots of servers. Um, and so what reading the file really means is that um, Spark is going to arrange to um, run a computation on each of many, many machines, um, each of which reads one chunk or one partition um, of the input file. Um, in, in fact, actually, uh, the system ends up or HDFS ends up splitting the file, big files typically, into many more partitions um, than there are worker machines. And so every worker machine is going to end up being responsible for looking at multiple partitions of the input files. This is all a lot like the way um, MAP works in MapReduce. OK, so uh, this is the first line in the program. and you may wonder what the variable lines actually hold. So it printed the result of lines, what, what, the, what lines points to. It turns out that even though it looks like we've typed a line of code that's asking the system to read a file, in fact, it hasn't read the file and won't read the file for a while. Um, what we're really building here with this code, um, what this code is doing is not causing the input to be processed. Instead, what this code does is builds a lineage graph. It builds a recipe for the computation we want, um, like the kind of lineage graph that you see in figure three in the paper. What this code is doing is just building the lineage graph, building the computation recipe, and not doing the computation. Um, and the computation is only going to actually start to happen once we execute what the paper calls an action, um, which is a function like collect, for example, um, that finally tells Spark, oh, look, I actually want the output now. Please go and um, actually execute the lineage graph and tell me what the result is. So what lines holds is actually a piece of the lineage graph, um, not a result. Now, um, in order to understand what the computation will do when we finally run it, we could actually ask, uh, Spark at this point, we can ask the interpreter to please go ahead and um, tell us what, you know, actually execute the lineage graph up to this point and tell us what the results are. Um, so, and you do that by calling an action. I'm going to call collect, which sort of just prints out all the results of executing the lineage graph so far. Um, and what we're expecting to see here is you know, all we've asked it to do so far, the lineage graph just says, please read a file. So we're expecting to see that the final output is just the contents of the file. Um, and indeed, that's what we get. And what, it, what um, this lineage graph, you know, this one transformation lineage graph res, uh, results in um, is just the sequence of lines, um, one at a time. So it's really a set of lines um, a set of strings, each of which contains one line of the input. All right, so that's the first line of the program. Um, the second line um, uh, the is, question, um, is collect essentially just just-in-time compilation of the symbolic execution chain? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what's going on. So what collect does is, it actually a huge amount of stuff happens if you call collect. Um, it, tell Spark to take the lineage graph and produce Java bytecodes that describe all the various transformations, you know, which in this case is not very much since we're just reading a file. Um, but so Spark will, when you call collect, Spark will um, figure out uh, where the data is you want by looking at HDFS. It'll, you know, just pick a set of workers to run, um, to process the different partitions of the input data. It'll compile the lineage graph 
or each transformation in the lineage graph into Java bytecodes. It sends the bytecodes out to the, all the worker machines that Spark chose, um, and those worker machines execute uh, the bytecodes, and um, the bytecodes say, oh, you know, please read, tell each worker to read its partition of the input, um, and then uh, finally collect goes out and fetches all the resulting data uh, back from the workers. And so again, none of this happens until you actually run an action. And we sort of I prematurely run collect now. Um, you wouldn't ordinarily do that. I just because I just want to see what the what the output is to understand what the transformations are doing. Okay, so um, if you look at the uh, code that I'm showing, the second line is um, this map call. So uh, the we've um, so line sort of refers to the output of the first transformation, which is the set of strings corresponding to lines in the input. Um, we're gonna call map. We've asked the system to call map on that. And what map does is it runs a function over each element of the input. That is, in this case, over each line of the input. And that little function is the S arrow, whatever, which basically describes the function that calls the split function on each line, split just, takes a string and returns a um, array of strings broken at the places where there are spaces. Um, and the final part of this line that refers to part zero when one says that for each line of input, we wanna have the output of this transformation be um, the first string on the line um, and then the second string on the line. So we're just doing a little transformation to turn these strings into something that's a little bit easier to process. Um, and again, um, out of curiosity, I'm going to call collect on links one just to verify that we understand what it does. Um, and you can see whereas lines held just string lines, uh, links one now holds pairs of strings of from URL and to URL, one for each link. Um, and when this executes, when this map executes, it can execute totally independently on each worker on its own partition of the input because it's just considering each line independently. There's no interaction involved between different lines or different partitions. These are, it's running, these, this map is a purely local operation on, on each input record. So it can run totally in parallel on all the workers on all their partitions. Okay. Um, the next line in the program is this uh, call to distinct. And what's going on here is that we only want to count each link once. So if a given page has multiple links to another page, um, we want to only uh, consider one of them for the purposes of page rank. And um, so this just looks for duplicates. Now, if you think about what it actually takes to look for duplicates in a you know, multi terabyte collection of data items. Um, it's no joke because the, the data items are in some random order in the input. And what distinct needs to do, since it needs to replace each duplicated input with a single input, distinct needs to somehow bring together all of the items that are identical. Um, and that's going to require communication. Remember, the, all these data is spread out over all the workers. Um, we want to make sure that any, you know, that we bring, we sort of shuffle the data around so that um, any two items that are identical are on the same worker so that that worker can notice, oh, wait a minute, there's three of these. I'm going to replace it, these three with a single one. Um, and that means that distinct, when it finally comes to execute, um, requires communication. It's a shuffle. Um, and so the shuffle is going to be driven by either hashing the items, so hashing the items to pick the worker that will process that item and then sending the item across the network or you know, possibly it could be implemented with a sort where the system sort of sorts all the input um, and then splits up the sorted input um, over all the workers. Um, I actually don't know which it does. Um, but anyway, it's gonna require a lot of computation. Um, in this case, however, almost in fact, nothing whatsoever happens because there were no duplicates. Um, and sorry, whoops. Uh, links to the, all right, so I'm going to run collect um, and the uh, links to, which is the output of distinct, is basically 
um, except for order identical to links one, which was the input to that transformation. Um, and the orders change because of course it has to hash or sort or something. All right, the next, um, the next transformation is is group by key. Um, and here, what we're heading towards is we want to uh, collect all of the links. Um, it, it turns out for the computation, as we'll see, we want to collect together all the links from a given page um, into one place. So uh, the group by key is going to group by, it's going to group all the records, all these from two URL pairs. It's going to group them by the from URL. That is, it's going to bring together um, all the uh, links that are from the same page, and it's going to actually collapse them down into the whole collection of links from each page is going to collapse them down into a list of links, into that page's URL, plus a list of the links um, that started that page. Um, and again, this is going to require um, uh, communication, um, although um, Spark, I suspect Spark is clever enough to optimize this because the distinct already um, put all uh, records with the same from URL on the same worker. Um, the group by key uh, could easily and may well just um, not have to communicate at all because it can observe that the data is already grouped by the from URL key. All right, so let's print links three. Let's run collect um, to actually drive the computation. Oops. And see what the result is. And indeed, what we're looking at here is an array of tuples where the first part of each tuple is the URL of the from page, and the second is the list of links that start at that from page. And so you can see that U2 has a link to U2 and U3, U3 has a link to just U1, and U1 has a link to U1 and U3. Um, okay, so that's links three. Um, now the Iteration is going to start in a couple of lines from here. It's going to use these links over and over again. Each um, iteration of the loop um, is going to use this uh, this information in links three um, in order to uh, sort of propagate probabilities, in order to sort of simulate these user clicking um, from uh, from all pages to all other linked to pages. So this link stuff is these link state is going to be used over and over again, and we're going to want to save it. It turns out that each time I've called collect so far, Spark has re-executed the computation from scratch. So every call to collect I've made has involved Spark rereading the input file, rerunning that first map, rerunning the distinct. Um, and if I were to call collect again, it would uh, rerun this group by key. But we don't want to have to do that over and over again on sort of multiple terabytes of, of links. Um, for each loop iteration, because we've computed it once and it's going to stay, this list of links is going to stay the same. We just want to save it and reuse it. Um, so in order to tell Spark that, look, we want to use this over and over again, the programmer is required to explicitly um, what the paper calls persist this data. Um, and in fact, in modern Spark, uh, the function you call is not persist if you want to save it in memory, but it, uh, but it's called cache. And so links four is just identical to links three, except with the annotation that um, we'd like Spark to keep links four in memory because we're going to use it over and over again. Um, okay, so the last thing we need to do before the loop starts is we're going to uh, have a set of page ranks for every page indexed by source URL. Um, and we need to initialize the every page's rank. It's not really ranks here, it's kind of probabilities. Um, we're gonna initialize all the probabilities to one. Um, so they all start out with a probability one with the same rank, but we're gonna, um, well, we're gonna execute code that looks like it's changing ranks, but in fact, um, when we execute the loop, in the code I'm showing, it really produces a new version of ranks for every loop iteration that's updated to reflect uh, 
the fact that the algorithm has kind of pushed page ranks from each um, from each page to the pages that it links to. So let's print ranks also to uh, see what's inside. It's just a mapping from URL, from source URL to the current page rank value for every page. Okay, now I'm gonna start executing inside. So there's one more question. Uh, does Spark allow the user to request more fine-grained scheduling primitives than cache? That is to control where data is stored or how the computations are performed? Well, yeah. Um, so cache, cache is a special case of a more general persist call, which um, can tell Spark, look, I wanna you know, save this data in memory or I wanna save it um, in HDFS so that it's replicated and will survive crashes. So you get a little flexibility there. Um, in general, you know, we didn't have to say anything about the partitioning in this code. Um, and Spark will just choose something. At first, the partitioning is driven by the uh, partitioning of the original input files. But when we run transformations that um, had to shuffle, had to change the partitioning, like distinct does that and group by key does that, Spark will do something internally that um, if we don't do any, if we don't say anything, it'll just pick some scheme like hashing the keys over the available workers, for example. Um, but you can tell it, look, you know, I, it turns out that this particular way of partitioning the data, you know, use a different hash function or maybe partition by ranges instead of hashing. You can tell it if you like um, more clever ways to control the partitioning. Okay, um, so I'm about to start executing a loop. The first thing the loop does, and um, I hope you can see the, the code on, on line 12, we're actually gonna run this join. Um, and this is the first statement of the first iteration of the loop. Um, what this join is doing is joining the links with the ranks and what that does is pull together the um, corresponding entries in the links, which said for every URL, what does it point, what does it have links to, and um, sort of putting together the links with the ranks. And what the rank says is for every URL, what's this current page rank? So now we have um, together in a single item uh, for every page, both what its current page rank is and what links it points to. Because we're gonna push every page's current uh, page rank to all the pages that it points to. Um, and again, this join is, a, is what the paper calls a wide transformation um, because it, it doesn't, it's not a local, um, the, the, uh, um, it, it needs to, it, it may need to shuffle the data um, by the URL key in order to bring corresponding elements of links and ranks together. Um, now, in fact, I believe Spark is clever enough to notice that links and ranks are already partitioned by key in the same way. Um, actually, that assumes that it had cleverly created links. When, when we created ranks, it assumes that it cleverly created uh, ranks using the same hash scheme as it used when it created links. But if it was that clever, then it will notice that links and ranks are hashed in the same way. Um, that is to say that the links and ranks are already on the same workers. Um, or sorry, the corresponding par partitions with the same keys are already in the same workers. And hopefully Spark will notice that and uh, not have to move any data around. If something goes wrong, though, when links and ranks are partitioned in different ways, then data will have to move at this point in order to uh, join up corresponding keys in the two uh, in the two RDDs. All right, so JJ contain, now contains both every page's rank and every page's uh, list of links. As you can see now, um, we have an even more complex data structure. It's an array with an element per page um, with the page's URL, with the list of the links, and the 1.0 there is the page U2's current rank. Um, and these are all, all this information is in each sort of a single record that has all this information for each page um, together where we need it. All right, the next step is that um, we're gonna figure out, every page is gonna 
push a fraction of its current page rank to all the pages that it links to. It's going to sort of divide up its current page rank among all the pages it links to. Um, and that's what this contribs does. Um, you know, basically what's going on is that it's a when another call to map, um, and we're mapping over the uh, for each page we're running map over the URLs that that page points to, and for each page it points to, we're um, uh, just calculating this number, which is the the from pages current rank divided by the total number of pages it points to. Um, so this sort of figure, you know, creates a mapping from link name to one of the many contributions to that page's new uh, page rank. Um, and we can sneak a peek at what this is going to produce. I'd say this is a much simpler thing. It just is a list of URLs and uh, contributions to the URLs page ranks. And there's there's more there's you know more than one record for each URL here because uh, there's going to for any given page there's going to be a record here for every single link that points to it, um, indicating the uh, contribution of um, from whatever that link came from to this page to this page's new updated page rank. What has to happen now is that we need to sum up for every page, we need to sum up the um, page rank contributions for that page that are in contrib. So again, we're going to need to do a shuffle here. We need, this is going to be a wide, um, a transformation with a wide input because we need to bring together all of the elements of, con of contribs um, for each page. We need to bring them together and in, in, to the same worker, to the same partition, so they can all be summed up. Um, and the way that's done, um, the Bay page rank does that is with this reduce by key call. Um, what reduce by key does is um, it, first of all, it brings together all the records with the same key and then um, sums up the second element of each one of those records for a given key um, and produces as output the key, which is a URL, and the sum of the numbers, which is the updated uh, page rank. Um, um, there's actually two transformations here. The first one is this reduced by key, and the second is this map values, which, uh, and, and this is the part that implements the 15% probability of going to a random page and the 85% chance of following a link. Um, all right. Let's look at ranks. By the way, even though we've assigned to ranks here, um, what this is going to end up doing is creating an entirely new transformation. Um, so not it's not changing the uh, values already computed, or when it comes to executing this, it won't change any values already computed. It just creates a new um, a new transformation with new output, and we can um, see what's going to happen. And indeed, we now have uh, remember ranks originally was just a bunch of pairs of URL page rank. Now again, we have pairs of URL page rank, but now they're different. We've actually updated them, um, sort of changed them by one step. Um, and I don't know if you remember the original page rank values we saw, but these are closer to those uh, final output that we saw than the original values of all one are. Okay, so that was one iteration of the algorithm. Um, when the loop goes back up to the top, it's going to do the same join, uh, flat map, and reduce by key. Um, and each time, it's again, you know, what the loop is actually doing is producing this lineage graph. And so it's not updating the variables that are mentioned in the loop, it's really creating a, essentially appending new transformation nodes to the lineage graph that it's building. Um, but I've only run the, the loop once um, after the loop. Uh, and then now this is what the real code does. The real code actually runs collect at this point. And so they're in the real page rank implementation only at this point with the, with the computation even start um, because of the call to collect here and to go off and read the input and run the input through all these transformations and shuffles um, for the wide dependencies. And 
finally collect the output together on the computer that's running this program. By the way, the computer that runs the program, the, the paper calls it the driver. The driver computer is the one that actually runs this Scala program that's kind of driving the Spark computation. Um, and then the program takes this output variable and runs it through a nice, um, a nicely formatted uh, print on each of the records in the collect output. Okay, so that's the um, that's the kind of style of programming that people use um, for Scala and I mean for uh, for Spark. Um, uh, one thing to note here relative to MapReduce is that this program, um, well, you know, it look, looks a little bit complex, um, but the fact is that this program is doing the work of many, many MapReduce um, or, or doing an amount of work that would require many separate MapReduce programs uh, in order to implement. Um, so, you know, it's, it's 21 lines and maybe you're used to MapReduce programs that are simpler than that, but this is doing a lot of work. Uh, for 21 lines, and it, it turns out that this is, and, you know, this is sort of a real algorithm too. So it's like a pretty concise and easy program, easy to program way to um, express vast uh, big data computations. Um, and, you know, people like it, it's pretty successful. Um, okay. Um, so, Again, I just want to repeat that until the final collect, what this code is doing is, is generating a lineage graph and not processing the data. And the, the lineage graph that it um, produces, actually the paper, I'm just copied this from the paper. Um, this is what the lineage graph looks like. It's, um, you know, this is all that the program is, is producing. It's just this graph until the final collect. Um, and you can see that it's a sequence of these processing stage where, um, we read the file to produce links and then completely separately we produce these initial ranks. And then there's repeated um, joins and reduce by key um, uh, pairs. Each loop iteration produces a join and a, uh, so each of these pairs is one loop iteration. And you can see again that the loop is appended more and more nodes to the graph rather than what it is not doing in particular, it is not producing a cyclic graph. Um, the loop is producing it. All these graphs are acyclic. Um, another thing to notice that you wouldn't have seen a map produce is that um, this data here, which was the data that we cached, that we persisted, um, is used over and over again in every loop iteration. And so it, Spark's going to keep this in memory um, and it, it's going to consult it multiple times. All right, um, so what actually happens uh, during execution? What does the execution look like? Um, so uh, again, the, the, the assumption is that the data, the input data starts out kind of pre-partitioned by over um, in HDFS. So, um, Assume our one file, it's our input file, is already split up into lots of, you know, 64 megabyte or whatever it may happen, uh, pieces in HDFS. Spark knows that um, when you start a, you actually call collect to start a computation, Spark knows that the input data is already partitioned in HDFS, and it's going to try to um, split up the work, the workers, in a corresponding way. So if it knows that there's I actually don't know what the details are, but um, it might actually try to run the computation on the same machines as store the HDFS data, um, or it may just uh, set up a bunch of workers um, um, to read each of the uh, HDFS partitions. And again, there's likely to be more than one partition per, um, per worker. So we have the input file and um, the very first thing is that the, um, each worker reads as part of the input file. So this is the, re the file read. 
if you remember, the next step is a map where the each worker is supposed to map a little function that splits up each line of input into a from to link tuple. Um, but this is a purely local operation. And so it can go on in the same worker. Um, so we imagine that we read the data and then in the very same worker, Spark is going to uh, do that initial map. Um, so, so even though I'm drawing an arrow here, it's really an arrow from each worker to itself. So there's no network communication involved. Indeed, it's just, uh, you know, we run the first read um, and the output can be directly fed to that little map function. Um, and in fact, this is that, that initial map. Um, in fact, Spark uh, almost certainly streams the data record by record through these transformations. So instead of reading the entire input partition and then running the map on the entire input partition, um, uh, Spark reads the first record or maybe the first just couple of records um, and then runs the map on just the sort of on each record. In fact, it runs um, each record of view through as many uh, transformations as it can before going on and reading the next little bit from the file. And that's so that it doesn't have to store, you know, so these files could be very large. Um, it doesn't want to have to like store the entire input file. It's much more efficient just to uh, process it record by record. Okay, so there's a question. So the first node in each chain is the worker holding the HDFS chunks and the remaining nodes in the chain are the nodes in the lineage. Yeah, I'm afraid I've been a little bit confusing here. Um, I think the way to think of this is that so far all this happen is happening on a, on individual workers. So this is worker one. Uh, maybe this is another worker. And um, each worker is sort of uh, proceeding independently. And I'm imagining that they're all running on the same uh, machines that store the different partitions of the HDFS file. But there could be network communication here to get from HDFS to the uh, to the responsible worker. But after that, it's very fast kind of local operations. Um, all right. Um, and so this is what happens uh, for, for the, what the paper called the narrow uh, dependencies, that is transformations that just look at, consider each record of data independently without ever having to worry about uh, their relationship to other records. Um, so by the way, this is already potentially more efficient than MapReduce. Um, and that's because if we have um, what amount to multiple map phases here, they just string together in memory. Whereas MapReduce, um, if you're not super clever, um, if you run multiple uh, MapReduces, even if they're sort of degenerate map only, MapReduce applications. Each stage would read its input from GFS, compute, and write its output back to GFS. And then the next stage would read, compute, write. So here we've eliminated the reading and writing. And it, you know, it's not a very deep advantage, um, but it sure helps enormously for efficiency. OK, however, um, not all the transformations are narrow. Not all of them just sort of read their input uh, uh, record by record kind of with every record independent from other records. And so um, what I'm worried about is the distinct call which needed to know all instances, all records that had a particular key. Similarly, group by key needs to know about um, all instances that have a key. Join also, it's got to move things around so that takes two um, inputs, uh, needs to join together all keys from both inputs that have this, all records from both inputs that have the same key. So there's a bunch of these non-local transformations, which the um, paper calls wide transformations, because they potentially have to look at all partitions of the input. And this is a lot like reduce in, in MapReduce. So for example, distinct, supposing we're, we're talking about the distinct stage, um, you know, distinct is going to be run on multiple workers also, and, you know, distinct works uh, on each key independently. And so we can partition the computation by key, but the data currently is not partitioned by key at all. It actually isn't really partitioned by anything, but just sort of however HDFS happened to store it. So um, for distinct, we're gonna run dis distinct on all the work, uh, partitioned on all the workers, partitioned by key. But um, you know, any one worker needs to see all of the input records with a given key. 
which may be spread out over all of the uh, preceding um, workers for the preceding transformation. Um, and all of the, all of the, you know, they're all, each of the workers are responsible for different keys, but the keys may be spread out over um, all of the uh, workers for the preceding transformation. Now, in fact, the workers are the same. Typically, it's going to be the same workers running the map is running, running the distinct, but the data needs to be moved between the two transformations to bring all the keys together. And so what Spark's actually going to do, it's going to take the output of this map, hash the each record by its key and use that, you know, mod the number of workers to select which worker should see it. Um, and in fact, the implementation is a lot like uh, your implementation of MapReduce. Um, the very last thing that happens in, uh, in the last of the narrow stages is that the output is going to be chopped up into buckets corresponding to the different um, workers for the next transformation, where it's going to be left waiting for them to fetch. Um, and so the scoop is that uh, each of the workers run the sort of as many stages, all the narrow stages they can through to completion um, and store the output split up into buckets. When all of these are finished, then we can start running the uh, um, workers for the distinct transformation whose first step is go and fetch from every other worker the relevant bucket of um, the output of the last narrow stage. Um, and then we can run the distinct because all the given keys are on the same worker and they can all start producing output um, themselves. All right, now, um, of course, these wide transformations are quite expensive. The narrow transformations are super efficient because we're just sort of uh, taking each record and running a bunch of functions on it totally locally. Um, the wide transformations require pushing a lot of data. In fact, essentially all of the data for page rank, you know, if you have terabytes of input data, um, that means that, you know, it's still the same data at this stage because it's all the links in the, in the web. So now we're pushing terabytes and terabytes of data over the network to implement this shuffle from the uh, output of the map functions to the input of the distinct functions. So the, these wide transformations are um, pretty heavyweight. Um, or a lot of communication and they're also kind of a computation barrier because we have to wait all for all the narrow processing to finish before we can go on to the um, to this wide transformation all right um, that said the uh, there are some um, uh, optimizations that are possible because Spark has a view. Spark creates the entire lineage graph um, before it starts any of the data processing. So Spark can inspect the lineage graph and look for opportunities for optimization. And certainly running all of the, you know, if there's a sequence of narrow stages, running them all on the same machine by basically sequential function calls on each input record, that's definitely an optimization that you can only notice if you sort of see the entire lineage graph all at once. Another optimization that um, um, Spark does is noticing when the data has, has, has already been partitioned due to a wide shuffle, that the data is already partitioned in the way that it's going to be needed for the next wide um, transformation. So in, the, uh, in our original program, um, let's see, I think um, we have two wide transformations in a row. Distinct requires a shuffle, but group by key also. Uh, it's going to uh, bring together all the records with a given key and sort of replace them with a list of, uh, um, for every key, the list of links, you know, starting at that URL. These are both wide operators. They both are grouping by key. And so maybe we have to do a shuffle for the distinct. Um, but Spark can cleverly recognize, aha, you know, that it is already shuffled in a way that's appropriate for a group by key. We don't have to do another shuffle. So even though group by key is, in principle, uh, could be a wide transformation. In fact, um, I suspect Spark implements it without communication because the data is already partitioned by key. Um, so maybe the group by key um, can be done in this particular case without shuffling data without um, expense. 
um, of course, it you know can only do this because it produced the entire lineage graph first and only then ran the computation. So the Spark gets a chance to um, sort of examine and optimize and maybe transform the graph. All right. Um, so the next topic, actually, uh, any any questions about the lineage graphs or how things are executed? Well, feel free to interrupt. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, fault tolerance. Um, and here, the um, uh, you know. The, these kind of computations, they're not, the fault tolerance they're looking for is not the sort of absolute fault tolerance you would want with a database where you really just cannot ever afford to lose anything. What you really want is a database that never loses data. Um, here the fault tolerance we're looking for is more like, well, it's expensive if we have to repeat the computation. We can totally repeat this computation if we have to, but you know, it would take us a couple of hours and that's irritating, um, but not the end of the world. Um, so we're looking to, you know, tolerate common errors, but we don't have to, certainly don't have to um, have bulletproof uh, ability to tolerate any possible error. Um, um, so for example, uh, uh, Spark doesn't replicate that driver machine. Um, if the driver, which was sort of controlling the computation and knew about the lineage graph if the driver crashes. I think you have to rerun the whole thing. But you know, any, only, any one machine only crashes maybe every few months, so it's no big deal. Another thing to notice is that um, HDFS is sort of a separate thing. Uh, Spark is just assuming that the input is replicated in a fault tolerant way on HDFS. And indeed, just, just like GFS, HDFS does indeed keep multiple copies of the data on multiple servers. If one of them crashes, it can soldier on with the other copy. Um, so the input data is assumed to be, um, to be relatively fault tolerant. And what that means at, a, at the highest level is that Spark strategy, if one of the workers fail, is just to recompute the, whatever that worker was responsible for to just repeat those computations um, that were lost with the worker on some other worker and on some other machine. Um, so that's basically what's going on. Um, and it, you know, it might take a while if you have a long lineage like you would actually get with PageRank because, you know, PageRank with many iterations produces a very long lineage graph. Um, uh, one way that Spark um, makes it not so bad that it has to be, may have to recompute everything from scratch if a worker fails, is that um, each worker is actually responsible for multiple partitions of the input. So Spark can move those part, move, give each remaining worker just one of the partitions and they'll be able to basically parallelize the recomputation um, that was lost with the failed worker by running each of its partitions on a, on a different worker in parallel. Um, so if all else fails, Spark just goes back to the beginning from the beginning input and just recomputes everything that was running on that machine. Um, however, and, and for now our dependencies, that's pretty much the end of the story. However, there actually is a problem with the wide dependencies that makes that story um, not as attractive as you might hope. So this is, uh, the topic here is um, failure, one failed node, one failed worker. Um, in um, a lineage graph that has wide dependencies. So the um, a reasonable uh, or a sort of sample graph you might have is, you know, maybe you have a, a dependency graph that sort of you know, starts with some narrow dependencies, um, but then uh, after a while you have a wide dependency. So you, you got transformations uh, that depend on uh, all the preceding transformations and then some, some more narrow ones. All right, and you know the game is that a single worker has failed, and we need to reconstruct the uh, you know maybe it's failed before we've gotten to the final action and produce the output. Um, 
So we need to kind of reconstruct, recompute what was on this field worker. The, um, the damaging thing here is that uh, ordinarily as, um, as Spark is executing along, it, uh, you know, it, it executes each of the transformations, um, gives us output to the next transformation, but doesn't hold on to the original output unless you, unless you happen to tell it to, like the links data is you know, persisted with that cache call. But in general, that um, data is not held on to because you know, if you have a like the uh, page rank lineage graph, maybe dozens or hundreds of steps long, you don't want to hold on to all that data. It's way, way too much to fit in memory. Um, so as the as Spark sort of moves through these transformations, it, it uh, discards it, all the data associated with earlier uh, transformations. That means when we get here, and if this worker fails, um, we need to re we need to restart its computation on a different worker you know, so we can read the input and maybe do the original um, narrow transformations since uh, they just depend on the input which we have to reread but then if we get to this wide transformation we have this problem that it requires input not just from the same partition on the same worker but also from every other partition and these workers though they're still alive have in this example have proceeded past this transformation and therefore discarded um, the output of this transformation, um, since it may have been a while ago. And therefore, the input that um, our recomputation needs from all the other partitions doesn't exist anymore. And so if we're not careful, that means that in order to rebuild this, uh, the computation on this failed worker, we may in fact have to re-execute um, this part of every other worker as well. Um, as well as the entire uh, lineage graph on the failed worker. And so this um, could be very damaging, right? If we're talking about, oh, we've you know, been running this giant Spark job for a day, and then one of a thousand machines fails, that may mean we have to, if we don't do anything more clever than this, that we have to go back to the very beginning on every one of the workers and um, recompute the whole thing from scratch. You know, it's going to be the same amount of work. It's going to take the same day to recompute um, a day's computation. So this would be um, unacceptable. We, we'd really like it so that if, if one worker out of a thousand crashes, that we have to do relatively little uh, work to recover from that. Um, and because of that, uh, Spark allows you to checkpoint, um, to make periodic checkpoints of specific transformations. So um, so in this graph, what we would do is in the um, Scala program, we would call, uh, it's, I think it's the persist call actually, we call the persist call with a special argument that says, um, look, um, after you compute the output of this transformation, please save the output to HDFS. Um, and, so every, and then if something fails, the uh, Spark will know that, aha, the output of the preceding transformation was saved to HDFS, and so we just have to read it from HDFS instead of um, recomputing it on all for all partitions back to the beginning of time. Um, and because HDFS is a separate storage system, which is itself replicated and fault tolerant, the fact that one worker fails, you know, the HDFS is still going to be uh, available even if a worker fails. Um, um, so I think, so for our example, um, page rank, I, I think what would be uh, traditional would be to tell um, Spark to checkpoint the output, to checkpoint ranks. Um, and you wouldn't even, you can tell it to only checkpoint periodically. So, you know, if you're going to run this thing for 100 iterations, um, it, it actually takes a fair amount of time to save the entire ranks um, to HDFS because again we're talking about terabytes of data in total so maybe we would we can tell Spark look only um, checkpoint ranks to HDFS every uh, every tenth iteration or something um, to limit the expense although you know it's a trade-off between the expense of repeatedly saving stuff to disk and um, how much it would cost if a worker failed and you had to go back and redo it. Um, 
All right, so there's a question um, when we call cache. That does act as a checkpoint. You know, okay, so this is a very good question, which I don't know the answer to. The observation is that um, we could call cache here, and we do call cache here, and we could ca call cache here, and the usual use of cache is just to save data in memory um, with the intent to reuse it. That's certainly why it's being called here, because we're using links for. Um, but in my example, it would also have the effect of um, uh, making the output of this stage available in memory, although not on, not in HDFS, but in the memory of these uh, uh, workers. And the paper never talks about this possibility. Um, and I'm not really sure what's going on. Maybe that would work. Or maybe the fact that the cache requests are merely advisory and may be evicted if the workers run out of space means that calling cache doesn't give you, it isn't like a reliable directive to make sure the data really is available. It's just, well, it'll probably be available on most nodes, but not all nodes. Because remember, even a single node uh, um, loses its data and we're gonna have to do a bunch of recomputation. Um, so we, I, I, I'm guessing that persist with replication um, is a firm directive to guarantee that the data will be available even if there's a failure, but I don't really know. It's a good question. All right. Um, okay, so uh, that's the um, programming model and the execution model and the failure strategy. And by the way, just to, to beat on the failure strategy a little bit more, the, the way these systems do failure recovery is, um, it's not a minor thing. As, as people build bigger and bigger clusters with thousands and thousands of machines, you know, the probability that a job will be interrupted by at least one worker failure, it really does start to approach one. And so the, um, the designs, recent designs intended to run on big clusters have really been uh, to a great extent dominated by the failure recovery strategy. And that's, for example, a lot of the explanation for why uh, Spark insists that the transformations be um, deterministic and why the, uh, these, its RDDs um, are immutable. It's because you know, that's what allows it to um, recover from failure by simply recomputing one partition instead of having to start the entire computation from scratch. And there have been in the past plenty of proposed sort of cluster big data execution models in which there really was mutable data and in which computations could be non-deterministic. Like if you look up distributed shared memory systems, those all support mutable data and they support um, non-deterministic execution. Um, but because of that, they tend not to have a good failure strategy. So, you know, 30 years ago when a big cluster was four computers, none of this mattered because the failure probability was little, very low. And so many different kinds of computation models seemed reasonable then. But as the clusters have grown to be hundreds and thousands of workers, um, really the only models that have survived are ones for which you can devise a very efficient failure recovery strategy that does not require um, backing all the way up to the beginning and restarting. And the paper talks about this a little bit when it's criticizing um, distributed shared memory. And that's a very valid criticism, um, but it's a big design constraint. Um, okay, so uh, the Spark's not uh, perfect for all kinds of processing. It's really geared up for batch processing of giant amounts of data, bulk, bulk data processing. So if you have terabytes of data and you want to, you know, chew away on it for, for a couple of hours, uh, Spark's great. If you're running a bank and you need to process um, bank transfers or people's balance queries, then Spark is just not relevant to that kind of uh, uh, processing, nor, nor to sort of typical websites where oh, I log in to, you know, I access Amazon and I want to order some uh, paper towels and put them into my shopping cart. Spark is not going to help you uh, 
maintain the, Spark, the um, shopping cart. Spark may be useful for analyzing your customer's buying habits sort of offline, um, but not for sort of online processing. Um, the other sort of kind of a little more close to home situation that Spark in the paper is not so great at is stream processing. Now, Spark definitely assumes that all the input is already available. Um, but in many situations, the input that people have is, is really um, a stream of input, like they're logging all user clicks on their websites and they want to analyze them to understand user behavior. You know, it's not a kind of fixed amount of data, it's really a stream of input data. Um, and, you know, Spark, as, in the, as described in the paper, doesn't really have anything to say about processing streams of data. Um, but it turned out to be quite close to home for people who like to use Spark. Um, and, and now there's a variant of Spark called Spark Streaming that, that is a little more geared up to kind of processing data as it arrives and you know, sort of breaks it up into smaller batches and runs them a batch at a time through Spark. Um, so it's good for a lot of batch stuff, but, but certainly not everything. Um, all right, to wrap up, the, uh, you should view Spark as a kind of evolution um, after MapReduce to kind of fix some expressivity and performance uh, sort of problems or uh, that MapReduce has. Um, what a lot of what Spark is doing is making the data flow graph explicit. Sort of, it wants you to think of computations in the style of Figure Three of entire lineage graphs of stages of computation and the data moving between these stages and does optimizations on this graph and its failure recovery is, is very much thinking about the lineage graph as well. Um, so it's really um, part of a larger move in big data processing towards explicit thinking about the data flow graphs as a way to um, describe computations. Um, a lot of the specific win in Spark um, have to do with performance. Um, part of the, and th these are sort of straightforward, but nevertheless important. Um, some of the performance comes from leaving the data in memory between transformations rather than you know, writing them to GFS and then reading them back at the beginning of the next transformation, which you would essentially have to do with MapReduce. Um, and the other is the ability to define these data sets, these RDDs, and tell Spark to leave this RDD in memory because I'm going to reuse it again in uh, subsequent stages and it's cheaper to reuse it than it is to recompute it. And that's sort of a thing that's easy in Spark and um, hard to get at in MapReduce. Um, and the result is a system that's extremely successful and extremely widely um, used and uh, viewed as a real success. Okay, that, um, that's all I have to say. And I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them.